will come to the Living a Meaningful and Fulfilled Life You Love channel. I usually post a collection of great inspiration stuff I found once a month. So simply click the subscribe button below to be notified through YouTube when I post a new collection. I studied the 10 most powerful empires over the last 500 years and the last three reserve currencies. It took me through the rise and decline of the Dutch Empire and the Gilder, the British Empire and the Pound, the rise and early decline in the United States Empire and the Dollar, and the decline and rise of the Chinese Empire and its currencies, as well as the rise and decline of the Spanish, German, French, Indian, Japanese, Russian, and Ottoman empires, along with their significant conflicts, as measured in this chart. To understand China's patterns better, I also studied the rise and fall of Chinese dynasties and their monies back to the year 600. Because looking at all these measures at once can be confusing, I'll focus on the four most important ones, the Dutch, British, US, and Chinese. You'll quickly notice the pattern. Now let's simplify the form a bit. As you can see, they transpired in overlapping cycles that lasted about 250 years, with 10 to 20 year transition periods between them. Typically, these transitions have been periods of great conflict because leading powers don't decline without a fight. So how am I measuring an empire's power? In this study, I used eight metrics. Each country's measure of total power is derived by averaging them together. They are education, inventiveness and technology development, competitiveness in global markets, economic output, share of world trade, military strength, the power of their financial center for capital markets, and the strength of their currency as a reserve currency. Because these powers are measurable, we can see how strong each country is now, was in the past, and whether they're rising or declining. By examining the sequences from many countries, we can see how a typical cycle transpires. And because the wiggles can be confusing, we can simplify it a bit to focus on the pattern of cause-effect relationships that drive the rise and decline of a typical empire. As you can see, better education typically leads to increased innovation and technology development, and with a lag, the establishment of the currency as a reserve currency. You can also see that these forces then declined in a similar order, reinforcing each other's decline. Let's now look at the typical sequence of events going on inside a country that produces these rises and declines. In a nutshell, the big cycle typically begins after a major conflict, often a war, establishes the new leading power and the new world order. Because no one wants to challenge this power, a period of peace and prosperity typically follows. As people get used to this peace and prosperity, they increasingly bet on it continuing. They borrow money to do that, which eventually leads to a financial bubble. The empire's share of trade grows, and when most transactions are conducted in its currency, it becomes a reserve currency, which leads to even more borrowing. At the same time, this increased prosperity distributes wealth unevenly, so the wealth gap typically grows between the rich haves and the poor have-nots. Eventually, the financial bubble bursts, which leads to the printing of money, an increased internal conflict between the rich and the poor, which leads to some form of revolution to redistribute wealth. This can happen peacefully, or as a civil war. While the empire struggles with this internal conflict, its power diminishes relative to external rival powers on the rise. When a new rising power gets strong enough to compete with the dominant power that is having domestic breakdowns, external conflicts, 
most typically wars, take place. Out of these internal and external wars come new winners and losers. Then the winners get together to create the new world order. And the cycle begins At again. its height, the Roman Empire was home to about 30% of the world's population. And in many ways, it was the pinnacle of human advancement. Its citizens enjoyed the benefits of central heating, concrete, double glazing, banking, international trade, and upward social mobility. Rome became the first city in history with one million inhabitants and was a center of technological, legal, and economic progress. An empire impossible to topple, stable and rich and powerful. Until it wasn't anymore. First slowly, then suddenly, the most powerful civilization on earth collapsed. By civilization, we mean a complex society where labor is specialized and social classes emerge and which is ruled by institutions. Civilizations share a dominant mutual language and culture and domesticate plants and animals to feed and sustain large cities where they often construct impressive monuments. Civilization lets us become efficient on large scales, collect vast amounts of knowledge and put human ingenuity and the natural resources of the world to work. Without civilization, most people would never have been born. Which makes it a bit concerning that collapse is the rule, not the exception. Virtually all civilizations end, on average, after 340 years. Collapse is rarely nice for individuals. Their shared cultural identity is shattered as institutions lose the power to organize people. Knowledge is lost, living standards fall, violence increases, and often the population declines. The civilization either completely disappears, is absorbed by stronger neighbors, or something new emerges, sometimes with more primitive technology than before. If this is how it's been over the ages, what about us today? Just as Europeans forgot how to build indoor plumbing and make cement, will we lose our industrial technology and with that our greatest achievements from one dollar pizza to smartphones or laser eye surgery will all this go away too today our cities stretch for thousands of square kilometers we travel the skies our communication is instant industrial agriculture with engineered high yield plants efficient machinery and high potency fertilizer feeds billions of people Modern medicine gives us the longest lifespan we've ever had, while industrial technology gives us an unprecedented level of comfort and abundance, even though we haven't yet learned to attain them without destroying our ecosphere. There are arguably still different civilizations around today that compete and coexist with each other, but together they also form a singular global civilization. But this modern globalized civilization is even more vulnerable in some ways than past empires because we are much more deeply interconnected. A collapse of the industrialized world literally means that the majority of people alive today would perish since without industrial agriculture we would no longer be able to feed them. And there's an even greater risk. What if a collapse was so deeply destructive that we were unable to re-industrialize again? What if it ruined our chances of enjoying a flourishing future as a multi-planetary species? A global civilizational collapse could be an existential catastrophe, something that ruins not just the lives of everyone alive today, but all the future generations that could have come into being. All the knowledge we might have discovered, the art we might have created, the joys we might have experienced would be lost. So how likely is all of this? Let's start with some good news. While civilization collapses have happened regularly, none have ever derailed the course of global civilization. Rome collapsed, but the Aksumite Empire, or the Teotihuacans, and of course the Byzantine Empire, carried on. What about sudden population crashes? So far, we've not seen a catastrophe that has killed much more than 10% of the global population. No pandemic, no natural disaster, no war. The last clear example of a rapid global population decrease was the Black Death, a pandemic of the bubonic plague in the 14th century that spread across the Middle East and Europe and killed a third of all Europeans and about one-tenth of the global population. 
If any event was going to cause the collapse of civilization, that should have been it. But even the Black Death demonstrates humanity's resilience more than its fragility. While the old societies were massively disrupted in the short term, the intense loss of human lives and suffering did little to negatively impact European economic and technological development in the long run. Population size recovered within two centuries, and just two centuries later, the Industrial Revolution began. History is full of incredible recoveries from horrible tragedies. Take the atomic bombing of Hiroshima during World War II. 140,000 people were killed, and 90% of the city was at least partially incinerated or reduced to rubble. But against all odds, they made a remarkable recovery. Hiroshima's population recovered within a decade, and today it's a thriving city of 1.2 million people. None of this made these horrible events any less horrible for those who lived through them. But for us as a species, these signs of resilience are good news. Why recovery is likely even in the worst case. One thing that's different from historic collapses is that humanity now has unprecedented destructive power. Today's nuclear arsenals are so powerful that all-out global war could cause a nuclear winter and billions of deaths. Our knowledge of our own biology and how to manipulate it is getting so advanced that it's becoming possible to engineer viruses as contagious as the coronavirus and as deadly as Ebola. Increasingly, the risk of global pandemics is much higher than in the past. So we may cause a collapse ourselves, and it might be much worse than the things nature has thrown at us so far. But if, say, 99% of the population died, would global civilization collapse forever? Could we recover from such a tragedy? We have some reasons to be optimistic. Let's start with food. There are 1 billion agricultural workers today, so even if the global population fell to just 80 million, it's virtually guaranteed that many survivors would know how to produce food. And we don't need to start at square one, because we could still use modern high-yield crops. Maize is 10 times bigger than its wild ancestor. Ancient tomatoes were the size of today's peas. After agriculture, the next step towards recovery would be rebuilding industrial capacity like power grids and automated manufacturing. A huge problem is that our economies of scale make it impossible to just pick up where we left off. Many of our high-tech industries are only functional because of huge demand and intensely interconnected supply chains across different continents. Even if our infrastructure were left unharmed, we would make huge steps backwards technologically. But then again, we are thinking in larger time frames. Industrialization originally happened 12,000 years after the agricultural revolution. So if we need to start over after a massive collapse, it shouldn't be that hard to re-industrialize, at least on evolutionary timescales. There's a hitch though. The industrial revolution was fueled literally by burning easily accessible coal, and we are still very much reliant on it. If we use it all up today, aside from making rapid climate change much worse, we could hinder our ability to recover from a huge crisis. So we should stop using easy-to-access coal, so it can serve as a civilization insurance in case something bad happens. Another thing that makes recovery likely is that we'd probably have most of the information we need to rebuild civilization. We would certainly lose a lot of crucial institutional knowledge, especially on hard drives that nobody could read or operate anymore. But a lot of the technological, scientific, and cultural knowledge stored in the world's 2.6 million libraries would survive the catastrophe. The post-collapse survivors would know what used to be possible, and they could reverse engineer some of the tools and machines they'd find. In conclusion, despite the bleak prospect of catastrophic threats, natural or created by ourselves, there is reason for optimism. Humankind is remarkably resilient, and even in the case of a global civilizational collapse, it seems likely that we would be able to recover, even if many people were to perish or suffer immense hardship, even if we lost cultural and technological achievements in the process. But given the stakes, the risks are still unnervingly high. Nuclear war and dangerous pandemics threaten the amazing global civilization we have built. Humanity is like a teenager, speeding around blind corners, drunk without a seatbelt. The good news is that it's still early enough to prepare for and to mitigate these risks. We just need to actually do it. 
We made this video together with Will McCaskill, a professor of philosophy at Oxford and one of the founders of the Effective Altruism Movement, which is about doing the most good you can with your time and money. Will just published a new book called What We Owe the Future, which is about how you can positively impact the long-term future of our world. If you like Kurzgesagt videos, the chances are high you'll like it. The book has some pretty counterintuitive arguments, like that risks from new technologies such as AI and synthetic biology are at least as grave as those from climate change. Or that the world doesn't contain too many people, but too few. And especially that everyday actions like recycling or refusing to fly just aren't that big a deal compared to where you donate or what career you pursue. Most importantly, it argues that by acting wisely, you can help make tomorrow better than today and how we together can build a flourishing world for the thousands or millions of generations that will come after us. Many things we at Kurzgesagt talk about regularly are discussed here in much greater detail. Check out What We Owe the Future wherever you get your books or audiobooks. Did we manage to unlock a new fear for you? Let's counter existential dread with appreciation for humanity. Look how far we've come as a species, what we've built, and where we've gathered. Let this new world map poster be a reminder of what we can achieve. There is a point. Is there a point to all this? Let's find a point. Is there a point to my act? I would say there is. I have to. The world is like a ride at an amusement park. And when you choose to go on it, you think it's real, because that's how powerful our minds are. And the ride goes up and down and round and round. It has thrills and chills, and it's very brightly colored, and it's very loud. And it's fun for a while. Some people have been on the ride for a long time and they begin to question, is this real or is this just a ride? And other people have remembered and they come back to us and they say, hey, don't worry, don't be afraid ever because this is just a ride and we kill those people. <laughs> Shut him up. We have a lot invested in this ride. Shut him up. Look at my furrows of worry. Look at my big bank account and my family. This is, has to be real. It's just a ride. But we always kill those good guys who try and tell us that. You ever notice that? And let the demons run amok? But it doesn't matter because it's just a ride. And we can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now between fear and love. The eyes of fear want you to put bigger locks on your door, buy guns. Close yourself off. The eyes of love instead see all of us as one. Here's what we can do to change the world right now to a better ride. Take all that money we spend on weapons and defense each year and instead spend it feeding, clothing, and educating the poor of the world, which it would many times over. Not one human being excluded. And we can explore space together, both inner and outer, forever in peace. Once upon a time, in a remote village nestled between the mountains, there lived a wise old monk named Master Shun. He was renowned for his ability to guide people in finding their inner voice, a skill that had been passed down through generations of monks in his lineage. One day, a young man named Kaido arrived at the monastery, seeking guidance from Master Shun. He had heard tales of the wise monk and hoped to learn the secret of listening to his inner voice. Master Shun welcomed Kaido with a warm smile and led him to a quiet room overlooking the monastery's lush gardens. Before we begin, said the wise monk, I want you to spend some time in silence, observing the garden and the creatures that inhabit it. Kaido sat by the window, watching the birds flit from branch to branch, the squirrels scampering across the grass, and the butterflies dancing in the breeze. As he observed the harmony of nature, he felt a sense of peace wash over him. After some time, Master Shun returned and asked Kaido what he had learned from his observations. Kaido replied, 
I saw how each creature has its own rhythm and purpose, and how they all coexist in harmony. Master Shun nodded, pleased with Kato's insight. Now let me tell you a story, he said, settling into a comfortable chair. Once, there was a young monk who lived in a monastery high in the mountains. He was diligent in his studies and meditation, but he struggled to hear his inner voice. One day, his master took him to a nearby cave, where they found a small, clear pool of water. The master instructed the young monk to gaze into the pool and describe what he saw. The young monk peered into the water and saw his own reflection, along with the reflections of the cave walls and the flickering light of their torches. The master then asked the young monk to close his eyes and listen to the sounds around him. The young monk heard the gentle dripping of water, the distant echo of their voices, and the soft rustling of the wind outside the cave. Finally, the master told the young monk to open his eyes and look into the pool once more. This time, the young monk saw something different. Beneath the surface of the water, he could see a world of shimmering fish darting among the rocks and plants. The master explained that the pool was a metaphor for the young monk's mind. The surface reflections represented his thoughts and emotions, while the hidden world beneath symbolized his inner voice. To hear that voice, the young monk needed to learn to look beyond the surface distractions and listen deeply to the quiet whispers within. Kato listened intently to Master Shun's story, feeling a spark of understanding ignite within him. He asked, how can I learn to look beyond the surface and hear my inner voice? Master Shun smiled and replied, you must practice mindfulness and cultivate stillness in your mind. Just as the pool's surface becomes calm when undisturbed, so too will your mind reveal its hidden depths when you learn to quiet your thoughts and emotions. Over the following weeks, Kaido practiced meditation and mindfulness under Master Shun's guidance. He learned to observe his thoughts without judgment, allowing them to pass like clouds in the sky. Gradually, he began to hear the whispers of his inner voice, guiding him with wisdom and clarity. As the story of Kaido and Master Shun comes to a close, let us reflect on the nature of happiness. Happiness, like the inner voice, is often found in the depths of our being, beyond the surface distractions of our thoughts and emotions. It is not a fleeting sensation or a temporary state, but rather a profound sense of contentment and inner peace that arises from living in harmony with our true selves. To cultivate happiness, we must learn to listen to our inner voice, allowing it to guide us on our journey through life. By embracing mindfulness and stillness, we can quiet the noise of our minds and tune into the wisdom that resides within us. In doing so, we discover that happiness is not something to be pursued or acquired, but rather a natural state of being that emerges when we align ourselves with our deepest values and aspirations. In the words of the ancient philosopher Lao Tzu, happiness is the absence of the striving for happiness. May we all find the courage to let go of our endless pursuit of external validation and material success, and instead turn inward, seeking the happiness that lies within our own hearts and minds. It's my absolute pleasure to be here with a man who needs no introduction, Deepak Chopra, who has been a pioneer in integrative well-being for the last several decades. Um, his name has become a sort of a household name, synonymous with integrative approaches to well-being. Um, he's the author of dozens of books. And Deepak, it's just wonderful to have you here with us. 
Deepak's also the co-founder of the Never Alone initiative of the Chopra Foundation, which we'll learn more about later that's specifically focused on mental health. How are you doing, Deepak? I'm good, uh, Cassie. Nice to talk to you. Great, great. Well, in this summit, we've been talking a lot about the ways mental health and well-being are being redefined in this modern era. Um, It's moving from sort of an old school view of mental health as you know, brain disease or character flaws, things like that, to a more integrative view. So how do you define true mental health? You know, Cassie, I've struggled with uh, these questions for a long time, <clears throat> and they keep evolving um, as insights. So, you know, I'm also kind of uh, dismayed that uh, while we talk about mental health, uh, Most conferences that I go to, scientific conferences, neuropsychiatry conferences, um, there isn't even a good definition of what the mind is. So um, I think uh, we have to first see what we mean by mind and then go to the next step of what is mental well-being or peace of mind or, you know, just... uh, well-being in general. So over the years, um, I have actually stopped distinguishing between what we call mind, body, and the physical world, because I think they're all activities of a deeper layer of existence that we call consciousness or awareness. Um, A good definition of mind that I came across a while ago that I kind of modified for myself actually came from Dan Siegel. Mm -hmm. Um, And he defined mind as an embodied and relational process that regulates uh, the flow of energy and information. And he stopped there, but regulates the flow of energy and information where? Um, well, I think in an ecosystem of relationships amongst sentient beings. So when I go to that definition, it's very obvious that the mind has no location. It's embodied in the brain, but also in the body, because whatever happens in the brain also happens in the body. And it's a relational process. In other words, A mind doesn't exist by itself. Also, it doesn't have a location. So where is the mind? Well, it's in this ecosystem of relationships among sentient beings, and it's regulating the flow of energy and information, probably to one purpose, and that is self-regulation or homeostasis or healing, uh, whatever word we mean, but this is a dynamic non-change in the midst of change that uh, we call well-being, which is not the same thing as wellness, although they're related. So wellness uh, is the measurement, I think, of things like cholesterol and blood pressure and heart rate and heart rate variability, endocrine function. Well-being is a state of awareness that allows that to happen. So given that mind has no location and it cannot operate by itself. I think mental distress occurs when we feel cut off from this web of relationship. So in Eastern wisdom traditions, all suffering or distress comes from actually not knowing this fundamental reality that there is no such thing as the separate self, number one. The separate self does not exist, number one. So in Eastern wisdom traditions, Vedanta, Kashmir Shaivism, aspects of Buddhism, they call these mental conditions kleshas, K-L-E-S-H-A-S. And basically, they're they're defined as five items, let's say, not knowing the true nature of reality, which means there's no separate self. Number one, Number two, grasping and clinging at experience, which is ephemeral, transient, uh, ungraspable. Every experience is like a flash of lightning in the sky. It's like a snapshot of perceptual activity or a snapshot of a 
thought, but by the time you experience it, it's gone. So grasping and clinging is impossible. You could I tell you, hold on to this thought. It's like holding on to your breath. You suffocate. You can't. The same thing applies to recoiling from experience, which we consider unpleasant. So that's the third klesha. First, not knowing reality. Second, clinging and grasping. Third, um, recoiling. Fourth, identifying with our self-image instead of our true self, um, which is a socially created concept, the self-image. Uh, we I like to joke, we've sacrificed ourselves for our selfies. And then the last uh, klesha, the fifth one, is the fear of death. So according to these wisdom traditions, the only cure for mental well-being is actually to not try and address it through the mind. You cannot address what we call the mind and its distresses by the mind because the mind by itself tends to be separate. We have to transcend the mind. Hence my interest in meditation over the last 30 years. And I realized that actually peace of mind is an oxymoron. Either there's mind or there's peace. Mm -hmm. So as long as there's mind, there's no peace. You have to transcend the activity of the mind. And then once you do that, you're in a place where you have the freedom from whatever we call experience. The awareness of an experience is not the experience. And therefore, the awareness of the experience, which is time-bound, and transient and ephemeral and ungraspable, the awareness of that is already intrinsically free of that. And so once you get to that as your fundamental state of being, then that state of being creates what you intend. And so over the years, I have always practiced the intention and shared with others that if you want well-being, mental, physical, whatever, and you can't separate the two, then the four components of that should be, and I just made this up, I don't even know if it's true, but one would be a joyful, energetic body on a, state, on a scale of one to ten. How joyful and energetic is your body? If you say eight, nine, and ten, your body is doing good, you're thriving. If you say six or seven, you're struggling in some area. You know, it could be sleep, could be lack of mind-body coordination, could be lack of exercise, could be poor nutrition, could be some uh, some uh, deficiency of a nutritional micronutrient, could be um, lack of healthy emotions like empathy, compassion, joy, equanimity. So joyful, energetic body is a good sign. Love and compassion in your heart is a good sign. A quiet, reflective, quiet, creative mind is a good sign. And most importantly, lightness of being, lightness of spirit, or what we simply call joy. So shortest answer to your question is mental well-being is joy. If you don't have joy, you miss the point of existence. As children, we are joyful, we are curious. We are uh, full of um, adventure, imagination, and friendliness, and joy, and laughter, and comfortable with ambiguity and contradiction. None of these social constructs have kind of impeded our knowing of ourselves. So shortest answer, mental well-being is joy. Thank you, Deepak. Yeah, I think this is one of the ways that mental health and well-being is being redefined in, in this mental health renaissance is that we've spent so much time focusing on the contents of experience and how can we manage or change the contents of experience when really it's more about how can we relate to the contents of experience and almost locate ourselves in a different place in our being so that we can observe those ongoing, ever-changing contents of experience um, but really, it's not about the chess game of trying to change them or rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, so to speak. T 
tell us a little bit about what led to the Never Alone initiative of the Chopra Foundation. I know you've had a strong interest in mental health and well-being over the last several years. The Never Alone initiative began when I met uh, uh, Gabriella Wright, whom you know, and this was almost three years ago, and I was actually doing an interview. She was interviewing me, and she was practicing at that time and still does various kinds of Buddhist meditation, and she Mm. had a history of trauma in her own life uh, when she was much younger, uh, very severe physical sexual trauma. And then her sister had passed away Mm. and died from suicide just a year before I met her. She was already doing work in Mm. monasteries and prisons and other places, And I thought, you know, we could join forces with the Chopra Foundation. And so I brought in Punal Chamachaya, who's our CEO, and we created the Never Alone initiative based on just three, four principles, attention, deep listening, affection, deep caring, um, including compassion, empathy, love, uh, appreciation, noticing the unique nature of every human being and being grateful for that uniqueness and finally acceptance not trying to change anyone it's hard enough to change ourselves when we want to changing other people is almost impossible so we call that the four a's and then what we created is an ecosystem both online and offline with those four principles attention affection appreciation and acceptance and in again, going back to Eastern wisdom traditions, they say in the Buddhists, they take refuge in the Sangha, which is the community, take refuge in the Dharma, our common purpose for existence, which is the evolution of our consciousness, take refuge in the Buddha, which is higher consciousness. Mm-hmm. Now, and, and that is a Buddhist kind of rephrasing of three very important words. <clears throat> that exist in in the spiritual literature of India, Sangha, Seva, and Simran. Sangha is community. Seva is selfless service or love in action or karma yoga. So Seva, service, Sangha, community, and Sadhana, which is a Sanskrit word also for daily spiritual practice, which could be reflective self-inquiry, Mindfulness training, mantra meditation, transcendence, all the different aspects which today we call metacognition, Mm -hmm. um, observing every aspect of experience without actually entangling yourself uh, in that experience, but being in that choiceless awareness space where ultimately you realize that every perception is an interpretation of a sensation. And um, perception is a learned phenomenon. And no matter what your perception is of reality, it's not reality. Whatever it is, you know, even the perception of a flat earth is a magical lie. The perception of the stationary ground is a magical lie. The perception of your physical body is not really who you are. Mm -hmm. So that kind of insight gradually happens and in Never Alone, we want to use a consciousness approach strategy where consciousness is fundamental and then mind is a modified form of consciousness. Body is another modified perceptual activity of consciousness. So is the world. And if you have an integrated mind-body world experience in awareness, then you're self-regulating, self-evolving, self-creating, and um, and it becomes over a period of time uh, an effortless evolution Mm. where there's no sense of agency. You know, it's the sense of agency that also creates a deep uh, uh, separation of the ego mind. Mm. So as we began to study, you know, what happens to people in this transformative process, 
that people call, quote unquote, waking up, there are many things. Uh, perception shifts, it's more in the present moment. Cognition shifts, there's more silence in the mind. Um, memory, we use memories but are not victimized by memory. Emotions move from fear and anger and hostility and guilt and shame and depression to to empathy, compassion, joy, equanimity. And then the sense of self transforms from body-mind to the source of experience, including the experience we call body-mind in the world. And there's a loss of sense of agency at the same time. That it feels amazingly healthy and mm. it feels amazingly joyful. At least that's been my journey through the years. And Never Alone has now taken that, scaled it up. We've used AI, emotional AI, um, and found that younger people especially are more comfortable talking to the AI than to a human being because they don't feel judged. So, you know, our emotional AI, which is called PV, which is Gabriella's sister's name, a pipette name, but now we also use it as an acronym, personalized interaction with intention. And it, this AI has intervened now in 6,000 suicidal ideations mm -hmm. and is having 20 million conversations with people at the same time. So then a while back, we also created crypto and blockchain to pay for counselors if people couldn't afford it. Mm. And uh, right now it's in English, but I just came back from the Arab world. Uh, they want to do it in Arabic in India. They want to do it in Hindi, Pakistan, maybe in Arab, in Urdu, in, in, uh, in Iran, in Farsi. I think as we combine our AI, which I call augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, because it's an extension of our own intelligence and there's deep learning involved. And uh, there is an evolution of this whole process. But I believe that a combined effort in these global sanghas, digital, online, offline, using AI, but also using counselors, and making it affordable is the only way mm. to scale our ability to help each other. Such great work. Thank you so much. And thanks to Gabriella and Punacha. And it was such a pleasure to have the Brick Foundation collaborate with Never Alone <clears throat> during COVID on a couple of our summits, the Never Alone summits, which are still free online and now have been seen by over 200,000 people in 70 countries and growing. That was just a great thing. So everybody listening, make sure to go look up Never Alone Summit and you'll find uh, hundreds of speakers talking about mental health and well-being. Deepak, you know, I think people listening can all identify with the feeling of getting stuck in the story and getting stuck in the identity and just having a really, really hard time doing what you're talking about. You know, like he said, she said, but, 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 you know, this happened to me that, you know, what am I going to do tomorrow? Do you have, you know, a few things, I know this is kind of a rudimentary question, but it's so practical, just a few things people might do when they feel stuck in the story and they have that little moment of, oh my gosh, I'm completely stuck and I can't get out. Again, you know, in, in our Eastern wisdom traditions, your body, physical body, which is of course an activity, it's not a noun, it's a verb. It's the projection of that story that you're talking about. The story is called karma or past experience and our interpretation of the past experience. If I ask you to close your eyes right now and do nothing, you'll become aware that you're having a conversation with yourself. And that conversation uh, is memory, also projected as imagination for the future. But the Buddhists and the Vedantists call the physical body, the karmic body or the conceptual body, the story body. And behind that story body is a more innocent body, subtle body, that is joyful. It's called ananda. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, the physical body, which is the outermost projection of the subtle body, which is mind, intellect, and ego, which in turn is a projection of a story. And the story is consciousness modifying itself 
as the subtle body, mind, intellect, ego, physical body, and the world. So the world is the world you're experiencing is your story about yourself and your past experiences. So liberation from stories is actually the root to joy because the physical body is called anamaya kosha, made of, kosha means layer, made of food or energy and prana. The subtle body is mind, intellect, and ego. But then there's a causal body, which is joy. Uh, it's called Satyam Shivam Sundaram. Satyam means truth, Shivam means pure consciousness, and uh, uh, Sundaram means joy and beauty. Presence in an object, any object, is, is beauty, and presence in a being is love. So they all go together. Mm. And therefore, the ultimate cure for all this karmic uh, distress, which happens to be both good stories and bad stories, mm -hmm. not one with the other, without the other, because all experiences by contrast. So when you go beyond <clears throat> the stories, the contradictions, the ambiguities of our mental nature, all there is, is a field of joy and transcendence and pure awareness and bliss, literally, ananda shakti is called. So how do we get there? Well, actually, first uh, asking ourselves, who am I without my story? Uh, and being in this moment, um, present to experience without necessarily interpreting the experience, but just being present to the experience allows us to know and ex and feel that all experience is time bound. You know, it, it fluctuates between what we call happiness and misery, uh, hot and cold, up and down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all experiences by contrast. So we transcend the experience itself. This has been the wisdom that we have had for thousands of years. But then what happened, I think, in psychiatry and mental, um, in this whole realm of psychology, is we were always trying to upgrade the stories. <clears throat> and that's impossible to really, because, you know, every story has infinite versions. So, you know, the Buddhists call this right view, which is, either no view or all views, no perspective or all perspectives, or just actually being in the moment without resistance, without anticipation, and without regrets. And you learn it, you learn it, you learn to be in the moment, and you realize that there's all there is, is the moment. And, you know, you can transcend your story right now, you know, by focusing, instead of on the sensation that gives rise to the story, to the space between those sensations. And that space is also the same space between breath, is the same space between imagination, this image and that Im image. It's the space between uh, per this perception and that perception, mm -hmm. between this intention and that intention. So I say, you know, if you want to transcend your story, um, in the moment, press the pause button and observe your reaction to react. And that's all that is needed in the moment to transcend the reaction, the observing mm -hmm. of the reaction to react. And uh, you can do it anytime, actually, by shifting to your breath, shifting to sensation of the body, shifting to space right here, the space has no story, although it's the origin of every story also. So, you know, when I ask people, look around you and tell me what you see, they describe objects, but they never describe the space uh, in which the objects are contained. The space is eternal, timeless. The objects come and go, including our own physical bodies and our minds and our uh, aspirations and our desires and our memories. Um, Focus on the space for once in a while. Soften your eyes and just be aware of this. 
mm-hmm. in which this, this, and all this is happening simultaneously, actually feels very joyful after a while because you realize that joy is just the absence of stories, which you just said earlier. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, brain science is beginning to show that when we take that more peripheral view, when we pay attention to the space, I know, remember I had a Buddhist teacher once say they drew a floppy big V on the on a board and said, what is this? And most people said it's a bird. And they said, no, it's the sky with a bird flying through it. And it's kind of like that peripheral actually changes the brain from this median that is storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. This is the planning and categorizing and comparing and all those good tools that we have to this more peripheral part of the brain being activated. So it gets reflected, not surprisingly, in the body and the brain when we do that. That's beautiful. You know, the the Vedantists call this space, this peripheral thing, uh, chit akash. So Mm -hmm. akash is the infinite space but it's imbued with consciousness. Mm. And we are expressions of that infinite divine chitakash of space of consciousness. It's not an empty void. It's the womb of creation. Everything is in this space. Yeah, I'm becoming more and more optimistic about the future of mental health care and mental well-being because I do think that there is a burgeoning renaissance of this different way of looking at things. And I think you know that I'm involved in the American Psychological Association's Division 36 to create spiritual guidelines, spiritual competency guidelines for all psychotherapists. And I'm really uh, glad to see that even the American Psychological Association is starting to say, hey, we need to take into account these systems that have existed for millennia that can add to mental well-being in addition to our more allopathic model. Do you feel optimistic? Do you have a sense of where you think mental health care is going? Do you think we I need do, to have I alternatives? Do. I do. We have to get rid of the idea that mental health is all above the head. It involves everything that we call experience and the source of experience. So, you know, recently, uh, I've always been a very avid uh, practitioner of yoga. Mm -hmm. But then what happened is, you know, I started uh, going to yoga classes uh, more more diligently. And I have several teachers, but two in particular, Sarah Finger and Eddie Stern. And we got interested in what was called Raj Yoga, Royal Yoga, and the eight limbs, which include, you know, it's very interesting, the... Niyama, yamas and niyamas, which are the first two limbs of yoga, are actually principles of social and emotional intelligence, the first two limbs of yoga. The third, which is the actual yoga practice, the you know physical postures, the physical postures are referred to as seats of awareness. How do you actually realize that your body is made of awareness? Mm-hmm. When you sit in a posture, whatever you call it, you know, happy baby, child pose, cow, um, cat cow, etc. They actually are states of awareness that you can access through the body. So that's the third limb of yoga. The fourth is pranayam, using breath to control the autonomic nervous system and influence the autonomic nervous system. So that's called pranayam. And the fifth is called in classical yoga, it's called pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses. But we are now beginning to understand that once you withdraw the senses, you have the ability to have interoceptive awareness of what's happening in the body and regulate the body. So that's the fifth limb. And then six, seven, and eight are dharna, focused awareness, dhyan, meditation, and samadhi, transcendence. These are the eight limbs. And as we started looking at them, we realized that each one of these practices is actually activating the vagus nerve. Mm. You know, the vagus nerve is being ignored in our whole science. We've talked mostly about sympathetic nervous system, sympathetic overdrive, inflammation, depression, stress. But there is something that counteracts that, and that is vagal activity of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, as a medical student in India, I grew up actually uh, 
watching studies on yogis who could change their heart rate, heart rate variability, body temperature, change their endocrine regulation, all through these practices. And I have now, after so many years, realized that we all have this capacity to regulate our mind-body system and that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are both, in a sense, meant for self-regulation. But when they're out of whack, then, of course, we feel not only mental distress, we feel physical illness as well. And that even to use the word mind-body connection is not really accurate. Mind and body are inseparable mm -hmm. in every experience which is happening in consciousness. So these practices, uh, yoga, uh, breathing, vagal activation, deep learning uh, through even AI. Now, you know, when you take a, a, a 30 second video of someone saying, I could just say, hi, I'm Deepak Chopra. Good morning. How are you? And you look at my facial expression, you look at the tone of my voice, mm. you look at my body language, your gestures, and you can correlate that with heart rate variability, with the endocrine system, with the immune system. We are coming to a time where through VR and augmented reality and what is called XR, we can actually modulate our biology and brain, neuroplasticity, and genetic, uh, epigenetic um, triggers for gene activation through so many ways, artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence, deep learning. Uh, if the body is made of consciousness, so is we are mm -hmm. made of consciousness. We should be actually exploring technology much more than we have done in the past. People are kind of afraid of technology because they think, you know, technology takes away my independence. Mm -hmm. Technology is neutral. We can use it now to look at deep learning systems, augmented reality, AI always to augment well-being, self-regulation is an integrated activity of mind, intellect, ego, emotions, physical body and physical universe as a unified process in consciousness. And there's no experience that is not measurable anymore. You know, mm -hmm. every experience has a biological correlate, a neural correlate. And by actually shifting our quality of our experiences from separation to unity, we can actually heal the body and we can see it happening. And then the big question arises, which is a very big question right now in science, where is this experience happening? Mm -hmm. You know, People say it's happening in the brain, it's happening in the body. No, the brain and body are experiences in awareness. So all experience actually is happening in non-local awareness. It's being mm -hmm. processed in non-local awareness which is timeless. And just this insight that we are at home in that non-local awareness and have the ability to consciously regulate mind, body, and perceptual activity, which we call the universe. This insight that we are non-local beings having a finite local experience is actually very uh, empowering, you know, yeah. and I think should be part of the teaching of what we call well-being in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, such an empowering vision. And, you know, there are actually hundreds of practices now that have evidence. You know, we recently did a study of 30 years of research on all types of movement and their relationship to mental health. And yoga had hundreds of studies. So sometimes the you know, traditional conventional medical world will say, well, show me the evidence. The evidence is there, even in their rule system, you know, like the, the evidence is there through our wisdom and through our clinical experience, our personal experience, but it's also there in science. And I love what you're saying about using technology as a tool. We're right now working at UCSD, developing virtual reality interventions to try to boost and mimic some of the things that happen in meditation, such as someone's train of thought, being able to actually put their thoughts on rail cars and watch a train going by very loud, close up, but then being able to move away from the train and see it chugging along in the distance as a train of thought. 
and many other kinds of um, perceptual shifts that even in the current version of virtual reality, which is kind of cartoonish because of the bandwidth issues, is still quite compelling to the mind and the body. The illusion is pretty compelling. So I love the the empowerment aspect of what we're talking about. And people can do this at home. They can do it for themselves. They can have peers and friends and neighbors and community members help. And that's also empowering for our communities. We recently partnered with the mayor of Miami and created a game for children on roadblocks where in order to move up to the next level of uh, achievement in the game, you have to be able to regulate your heart rate variability or your breathing and actually show that you are able to influence and integrate mind and body as a game process. So what you're saying has endless possibilities. Yeah. And you um, saw it a long time ago with Wild Divine. I think you were involved in the very first. I was. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Was, yeah. Well, yeah. we've come a long way and everybody is now uh, jumping on this uh, idea that we are uh, what we call the physical body and the mind and uh, the physical world are actually um, a collective dreamscape and our bodies are part of the fictional characters in the dreamscape. And that is actually, in a way, empowering because we are not the dream. We are the dreamer. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed in myself, spending time in virtual reality in Avatar helps me recognize that in the real world, I'm also in Avatar. (laughs) That's it. You're also an author. Yeah. Thank you, Cassie. That Thank was you so much. Is there any come? part of your work that you want to draw people's attention to right oh, now? Well, I, I just have a new book that's coming oh, out great. this week, so I might as well show it to you. Sure. Well, Living in the Light, Yoga for Self-Realization with mm. my yoga teacher, Sarah Platfinger. And it is about well-being and self-realization beyond self-improvement. I think everybody is trying to improve themselves, but beyond that is actually realize who you really are. Mm. And that is ultimate liberation from suffering. So Mm. thank you. Wonderful. Okay, Living in the Light by Deepak Chopra. And who's the... Sarah Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Yes, and count me for anything that you want to do. I'm here to serve. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. This was it for today. Really hope you liked it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, maybe even leave a comment below, and subscribe to be notified through YouTube when there will be new videos about living a meaningful and fulfilling life you love. In any case, thank you very much again for watching and looking forward to hopefully see you in the next video.